I'm really excited you're here. Thank you for coming from far, from wide, from wide, wherever you come from. <laughs> we're happy you're here. And uh, I love what everything that Eric was saying. Our church, we're, we're, a, we're a Christian church, a Protestant church, but we believe that God wants to use your life for his will. No matter what your background is. We want to be an inclusive church, a diverse church. We believe that God is going to do something creative in your heart. We see future physicians and lawyers and artists, parents. I don't know, what do you guys want to do these days? What do kids go to school today? Social workers, you know. Whatever it is, I know that God has you here for a purpose. And I believe He wants to use your life for His purposes. And I think there's nothing better than living a life that glorifies Him. And that's, where, that's why we're here. We're here to bring hope to people who are looking for hope and direction. Yeah. I don't have the answers, but we know who does. Yeah. Um, so thank you for coming. I'm so excited to come. And uh, I hope you find home here. Now, this is our first meeting. It's not a church service yet, although it kind of feels like it. These are just like DNA meetings we're calling. We're trying to build a strong base. Just the people who want to be involved with our church. And you're welcome to come here. Just filling things out. It's awesome. That's who we want to come. And uh, eventually we're going to launch a church service here in Philadelphia. And so this is the beginning stages of what Eric was saying, something great that God is going to do. Um, I can say that because it wasn't something that we dreamed up or came up with. It wasn't something that we decided to do. It's a long story, but it's a whole lot workings of people from Scotland and moving and not knowing people and people in higher places wanting a service in Philadelphia and God speaking to people in Texas and all kinds of stuff. And then we get this building at a tenth of the price owned by a Christian guy. He's like, oh, you want to do church here? Yeah, let's do it. You know? awesome. And it's like, oh, we're starting now? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, but I'm, think, I'm thankful you're here in your own board. And do we have something I can put my Bible on? Yeah. All right. So, you all right? You can turn, you can, uh, you have your Bibles? Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you, Josh. Do you guys know who William Penn is? Yeah. Alright. Anybody want to take a stab at who he is? He was the founder of Philadelphia. Yes. Ow! You ruined my story. No, <laughs> it wasn't so hard to figure out, right? Okay, so, uh, but most of you guys know, but this is my wife here. I got married four months ago. Woo! And she's, she's amazing. But we got married here at City Hall. There's a reason why I'm telling you that. <laughs> so, we got married here at City Hall. Okay, that's where we signed our papers. And we live in Philadelphia. We just moved here. And um, we were walking through the, the bottom part. Was it like, like the, on the street level? And in the North Hall, there's a plaque there. Has anyone ever been to City Hall? You guys, have been to City? Okay, there's a plaque there, and it's a prayer from William Penn. And uh, it really, it just grabbed grabbed my attention immediately. So I stopped to read it. And if we can look at the next slide, this is his prayer for Philadelphia. Since thou, Philadelphia, the virgin settlement of this province, name before you were born, what love, what care, what service, what travail there have been to bring thee forth and to preserve thee from such as would abuse and defile thee. I'm no King Jameser, but I think that means Philadelphia was hard to build. Uh, O thou, mayest be kept from the evil that would overwhelm thee, that faithful to the God of thy mercies and the life of righteousness, thou may be preserved to the end. My soul prays to God for thee that thou may stand in the day of trial, and that their children would be blessed and thy people saved by his power. I'm going to tell you a story. You're going to travel with me on a little story. I love telling stories. Uh, William Penn was born in October 14th, 1644. Little, popped out of his little squeaky head, traveled through the uterine capsule, came out into a dark, cold, cruel world. Following <laughs> very cold, cruel, evil world, gloomy. Some people call it London. <laughs> okay. Where's Alex? Alex isn't even here. All right. Good things come from London. We've got Alex, right? Okay, but so he was born there, and he was born to an admiral of the navy. Um, 
you know, actually, William Penn is named the first great pioneer of American liberty, of, you know, of liberty altogether. He studied, he was a smart guy, he went to Oxford, he studied social justice, he studied at the top, uh, it was called Lincoln's Inn, the top uh, law school in England at the time. So he's a smart guy. A few years later, well, many years later after he was born, he became a Quaker, all right? Anyone know what a Quaker is? Yeah. Opium. Opium? Quakers. <laughs> so Quakers are a faith that they, they um, they're awesome people, I think. They, you know, they believe in Jesus. They, they do a lot of, uh, they're really minimalistic. They believe in plain clothing, really being simple. So he went to a meeting there. And at this time, it's under Protestant rule in England. And people are getting persecuted for their faith. Catholics are going back and forth depending on what king is in charge, okay? And then he becomes a Quaker. Cops come busting into the building, through the night. So open it up, it's the cops. Yo, run, get out the windows. Everybody starts getting out, whatever. But then they, they start arresting everybody. William Penn, they leave by himself because he's dressed too well. And they're like, how could this aristocrat be here? We don't really want to arrest him. But you know what he did? He said, if you're going to take these men and women, you have to take them. So he went and served time in jail. And there in jail, he wrote all the pamphlets and the doctrine for the Quaker faith. Really quite incredible. Then he comes out and he starts doing these meetings in the, in this, in the countryside. And I'm telling you, this is the reason why I'm telling you the story, just bear with me. So he's having all these meetings and telling people about religious freedom, religious tolerance, how people should choose their own faith. This is William Penn. He gets arrested again, and he has to go against a thing called the Conventicle Act. Long story short, he stands up for religious tolerance, wins this huge case, becomes really famous in Europe, starts traveling around telling everyone. He comes back to England. And he's trying to get people to buy into his religious tolerance, saying like, hey, you can't arrest someone for having a different view of God than you. They should choose who they want to serve. I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty fair and awesome. But at the time, it was revolutionary. He got him put back in prison. It he did it seven months, he comes out, and he realizes no one's going to budge. So he goes to King Charles. King Charles owed his dad 16,000 pounds, which was a lot of money at the time, because his dad was an admiral in the Navy, his back pay. Typical government stuff. Who's waiting on that? Anyone work for the government? <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's a while. Um, okay, so, you know, he gets his money and he, he, they say, you know what, you can have this new land in America. Well, it was a new world at that time. And you can go start your own colony and do whatever you want, but you're kind of making a mess, so let's get the Quakers out. So he travels on this boat. It's called the Welcome. He lands in this place called Pennsylvania. It means the land of, what is that? The land of forests. Or something like that. It was named after his dad. But then he started a city. Anyone know what the city was called? Philadelphia. Do you know what Philadelphia stands for? Yeah. City of Cheese Whips, right? So, uh, <laughs> so he starts Philadelphia. But this, <laughs> this city was meant to be our place of refuge for everybody, okay? Native American Indians, uh, people of all sorts of faith. And he, he created what was called his holy experiment. All right? Now, this is where we're going today. We finally arrived. Holy experiment. You know what he did? He encouraged women to get an education and speak up for themselves. He said, you know what, let's do this weird thing. Let's create a constitution and allow people to make amendments. And let's have peaceful change instead of fighting and killing each other. <laughs> Sounds pretty rational. <laughs> he said, oh, if you're new here, you don't have to pay taxes for the first year. Let's, let's get your feet on the ground and let's figure out what's going on. He said, you know what, anyone can come here and practice their own religion. And they're not going to be judged or condemned for it. Any ever hear of Voltaire? Anyone ever hear of Voltaire, the philosopher? Yep. Okay, so he spoke out about um, William Penn, and he said this. William Penn might, with reason, boast of having brought down upon the earth the golden age, which in all probability never had any real existence but in his dominions. Anyone ever heard of the golden age? Yeah, kind of. It's, so Voltaire is giving William Penn credit and saying he is probably the only one that ever had a golden age. He created it. You know why? Because people were free to worship the God they wanted to choose. And don't get it twisted, he was like, he wouldn't judge anybody, but he was a God for your man, he loved Jesus. But he wanted people to choose to worship Jesus. He wanted people to worship the way they wanted to worship. And I think that's awesome. I think that's so freeing and so, com and so compelling to me. And standing up for the underdog, he stood up for the hopeless, and that's what we're called to do. So here, Philadelphia was born. The city of refuge. It was a city for the seeker. It was a city for the hurting. It was a city for the prosecuted. It was a city for those who would couldn't worship in their homeland. Philadelphia was born. So welcome to Philadelphia. How about today? What would you call Philadelphia? Do you think it's a refuge? 
you think it's a city of peace? Come on, what would you, what would you name one adjective for Philadelphia? Let's go. Eclectic. 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 Anyway, come on, shut them out. I'm only going to be about 20 minutes, so you guys got to engage right now. Let's go. Eclectic, what do you got? Anybody? High energy. High energy. All right. Hustling. I'd say growing. I'd say busy. Yummy food. Weird hair. Weird hair. I'm not talking about anybody in particular, right? <laughs> Police for Police for What else? We shouldn't laugh. The Pope. The Pope. When I think of Philly, I think of the Pope. That's right. Definitely not Rome. Rocky. Rocky. Huh? The PVA. The PVA. So you said Yeah, I like those guys. I haven't been here long enough to hate them. Horrible fans. Horrible fans. You know, I, you know what I would think of when I think of I do think of violence sometimes because it wasn't too long. I know my facts are outdated, but Philadelphia had the most gun deaths out of any major city in America, right? So maybe that's a little thing to worry about. Um, I, when I think of Philadelphia, I think of I think of busy. I definitely think of busy. I think of a lot of people. Um, some people would say, I've heard people say that the world is kind of like a, kind of a sad place, maybe lonely. You know what I see in Philadelphia when I really look around? I see turmoil. I see turmoil. I see turmoil in the leadership. I see turmoil between sex. I see turmoil between uh, groups and churches. I see one church that wants to have certain rights for people, another church that's vehemently opposing it. I see people looking around for their identity, kind of searching, you know. I see tall towers that, you know, William Penn's building, City Hall used to be the tallest building in Philadelphia. And then before that was a church. Not anymore, you know who it is? Comcast. You know? That's what I see in Philadelphia. I see industrialization, I see growth. I see opportunity, too. It's good things. I love Philadelphia. But I do see a city of turmoil. And uh, I also, when I think of turmoil, I think of Philadelphia flipping eagles. <laughs> one day they're hot, one day they're cold. You know, I, I like the Eagles in some ways because they're kind of like Chick-fil-A. They don't show up to work on Sunday. <laughs> I like the Eagles. I like the Eagles. You know, and Sam Bradford told a joke to his receivers. Sam Bradford told a joke to his receivers. It went over their head. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I'm done. I digress. I like the Eagles. Okay, just say it again. But, All right, so... Philadelphia is a city of turmoil, in my opinion. All right, and uh, that's not what it was meant to be. If you turn your Bibles to Psalm 107, six through nine, if you don't have it, don't feel awkward. I'm going to read it to you. No worries. Uh, it said, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. I give you a second to get there. That was unfair, wasn't it? Yeah. Psalm 107, six through nine. You doing okay? You live out there? I am. Yeah. Uh, great. Great. It's a good day to be alive in Philadelphia. And I love this building. So awesome. Alright, Psalm 107, 6, 9. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. They cried to the Lord in their time of trouble, and he delivered them from the distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Cities were created to be a place of refuge. Yeah. Have you ever seen The Hobbit? And they got those hawks. Like, ah! They like run around. Okay, but when they're coming, everyone goes to the city walls, right? They hide, hide the kids, hide your wife. They hide the downtown. Hide the kids, hide the kids right? All, of the, all the defenses get behind the city walls, right? And they prepare. And that's what Scripture's saying here. The Lord, in their trouble, he delivered them from the distress, and he led them straight to a city to dwell in. A place of peace. A place of rest. A place where they were protected. I think in America, a lot of times people are just working the city while they're young, and then they're waiting to go get their house in the suburbs. You know, where no one's going to be have different views than them. No one's going to be bumping them on the road. You know, it's going to be a little slower pace. But I think it's the opposite. Cities were created to be a place of refuge. Philadelphia was created to be a place of refuge. You know, when Jesus talks about well, all Scripture talks about a holy Jerusalem that's coming. He's not building suburbia, you know? Yeah. When God restores the earth, he's not creating us and going to spread us all around in the trees and let us have our own tree houses. He's building a city for us to dwell together. Right. So Cities are powerful places, the places of creativity, the places that should be places of refuge. 
But do you feel like it's a place of refuge when you walk around? We have some people from Joburg. Dude. I don't know if you feel like it's a place of refuge in Joburg, you know? It's a little dangerous. But, right. Okay, but you know, and sometimes you get that in Philadelphia too. But the city isn't meant to be like that. It wasn't created for that purpose. It was meant to be a place of refuge. Hold on to that, all right? So, um, I guess the next part is, why, why are you telling me this? Why are you talking about, well, I think of some of the, you know, wait, some of the parts makes the whole. So therefore, it's people who are in turmoil, mm. not just the city that's in turmoil. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not about, like, oh, let's look at the city and let's figure out what's going on. It's about the parts that make up the city. Right? I, when I see Philadelphia, I see people in turmoil. I see individuals in turmoil. And um, it's, it's a great timing for us because we're in Romans 7 as a church. That's my dad, he spoke on uh, Romans 7 this morning. He did an awesome job. But we're going to kind of focus in on the same scripture. It starts with Romans 7, 19. And it's Paul, he's talking about his turmoil. He's talking about his issues. He's talking about, he wants, you know, basically, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I know I shouldn't do, I do do. I do do. Okay. Yeah, for, the, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. This is 19. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find that a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my, in my members. And then he says, okay, this is the part we need to listen to. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul was a great leader. The church wouldn't be what it was without him. Agreed? He's the founder of the church, as we know it. Basically, he's the one who brought it out to the world. But he had inner turmoil that he had to deal with. And before we even look outside these walls, I think maybe we could look deep inside our own hearts and see the turmoil that we deal with. I call it an agitated spirit. It's just what I call it. Someone who's not at rest. Someone who's itchy and moving around all the time, looking for the next thing. Maybe it's filled with anger or guilt, and that's why you got to keep moving. Because if you slow down, you start thinking about everything you did or what other people did to you. Or maybe you get angry at somebody else. Maybe the short temper. Internal conflicts. Who am I going to be? What am I going to do? Does anyone love me? What's my career going to be? Who's accepting, who's accepting me now? I find it so much when I talk to my friends, and even myself sometimes. When it gets too quiet and the world slows down, sometimes that's the scariest time. It's when you really got to figure out who you are and what you're created to be. And the city is full of people who busy themselves to mute that voice. But you know what? That voice, to me, is the voice of God calling to you. We can look around in the city and see people busy. We can see drug dealers on one corner. We can see people with tons of money, people homeless, people with schizophrenia on the street moving luggage across. We can see whatever we want to see. But you know what I see when I walk down the city? I see God. I see an opportunity. Because yeah. God is in everything. He's all around us. And how much more? He's with his people. And look at all the people in the city. He's not out in the woods. Well, he is. He's everywhere. But he's here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Take that back. <laughs> You know, he's not just out there. <laughs> he's yeah. here with us. Yeah, exactly. He's here with you. Yeah. He's here with the city of Philadelphia. Yeah. We serve a God who never writes anything off. Thank Do you, you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. If he had, he would have sent his son Jesus to come and die to restore the world. Instead, he would have just wiped it out and started over. Yeah. He's a God who continually perseveres and pursues people. Yes. Yeah. You see where I'm going with this now? God is love. And you know what scripture says about love? It says love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. These feelings of guilt and unworthiness that everyone has, it's God calling them, saying, hey, you were called to something greater. Yes. Come to me, I can give you purpose, I'll give yeah. you a future. Yeah. I'll tell you why you were created. And you'll find so much more fulfillment in me than in around you. So when I see the city, instead of seeing people in turmoil, I like to look at opportunity. Yeah. Let's look at opportunity if we grow a church in Philadelphia. Yeah. Let's see people, and not 
not to use them, but to see God use them so that they can benefit. They can become the best lawyer or whatever it is they're studying to do because they have the power of God living inside of them. Yeah. And there's something liberating about not living for yourself anymore. Can you guys agree? Yeah. yeah. So, your failures mean a lot to you when you're just living for yourself. But when you're living for someone else and you recognize that God is with you, it's not so bad. So freeing. And I hope that we experience that as a church. So it starts with you. It starts with each one of you. Let's keep reading with Paul. Verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You see, Paul couldn't do anything about it himself, but it was the spirit of God that set him free from his inner turmoil of trying and failing and trying and failing. And it was God who set him free through Jesus Christ. And that's why we're a church who believes in Jesus and we believe in new beginnings for everybody. We believe there's always a new beginning. I find it interesting Paul is talking about the Spirit of Christ. Let's just do something real practical. How could you live a life like that? How can you recognize that God is with you? How do you live a life empowered by the Spirit of Christ? For me, it's an easy answer. It's acknowledging, recognizing that He's with you. This is profound, people. This is huge, all right? If you live a life recognizing that God is with you, always changes who you are. So maybe for you, you've made a decision to follow Jesus. You follow him. You love him. But this turmoil that's in your spirit from time to time or in the people that you encounter, it comes from a disconnect of recognizing that God is in control. He's in the situation. He's all around you. He's everywhere. It's a simple thing. But I think it's missed so often. Psalm 46 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, and even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, God is our refuge yes. and strength. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. You know how things change? That's when you recognize that God is with us. Have you ever heard of Helen Keller? Yes. <laughs> Silly question. Nice one. Okay, so Helen Keller is the butt end of a lot of jokes nowadays. I don't know why. She's an amazing woman. Okay. But let's talk about it for a second. She was told about God. If you read her writings, they say the Christian God, but she was told about God. And this is her response when her friend, it was Philip Books, I think, who told her. This is what she said. I always knew he was there, but I didn't know his name. This is a woman who had never known what a name was. She didn't have a name. She couldn't put a name on anything. She was a woman who didn't know how to communicate a lick, but as soon as she's told who God is, she says, I knew he was there. I just didn't know what to call him. And Helen Keller's no different to anybody else. Maybe she heard him more because she couldn't hear the world and she couldn't see the world, but God is pursuing every person on the planet. How amazing is that? But we walk down the street and we don't see his presence because we hear everything else. But you know what? It's about what you put your focus on. Where you turn your attention. It's about acknowledging the spirit of God. Because he's here and he's calling you. No matter what stage of your life you're in, he wants you. He loves you. And he's pursuing you. And that's the message we're going to bring to Philadelphia. We want to let's, see, let's see how that works into what we're doing. It's our holy experiment. There's a song, it goes like this, forgive me, but I'm going to have to sing it. It goes, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you. You guys know that song? Ever heard of it? Yeah. It's your praise in our lungs. Our holy experiment is this, recognizing that God is in the very air that we breathe. He's here. He's here tonight. He's in this room. He's always been here. 
One thing I can't stand is when people pray, oh, that sounds selfish, it's not about me, but you know, when people say, I just pray, God, that you'd be with me. It's like driving in the car and it's like, hey, hey Natalie, you want to come with me to Rite Aid? Cool, let's we get in the car. We're in the, hey, Natalie, you want to come with me to Rite Aid? It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like God is always with you. And that kind of acknowledgement is so freeing and empowering and it makes you bold. It makes you a better person. It makes you a better leader. It takes you into your workplace and catapults you into success, not for yourself, but for God. Because everything you do is purposeful. Yep. To create a place where the presence of God is felt and known, and we're going to declare it. Yes. If I can, I'm going to steal from you. Uh, gosh. Yeah, give me this thing. Yeah, all right. So if I took this phone from you, you're leaving today, walking down the stairs, and you see the phone sitting on the stairs. Would you be okay taking it home? I just stole it from you. You find it on the steps. Can I take it back? Would you take it? Would you pick it off the steps and walk home? Is mine? Yeah, sure. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> what, if you, what if you had a bike? You ride around the city, it gets stolen, then you're walking home one day and you find the bike there. Would you take it home? Yeah. It's your bike. It's your bike. Look. This was crazy for me. This city is God's city. You see that? It was created for, to be a city of refuge, to glorify God. I mean, I believe all creation was, but how obvious with Philadelphia. It was made for his glory. And you know what we're doing with our holy experiment? We're taking it back. And we're not the only ones. that God is here to occupy every soul and every heart out of the world. He's here, to fill, he's, he's here to take back what is his. And in your life, this is where it gets personal, in your life, the dark spaces of your heart and your soul, he wants to take those back from himself too. The places you don't talk about. Because how can we, how can we minister the word as Christians? How can we reach out to other people if our souls are restless ourselves? Here, come find refuge in Jesus. But we lay awake at night. Or we have guilt in our lives. Or we have anger or whatever it is in our life. Because we push God out of those spaces. But here's the thing. The very breath you breathe is his. I'm wrapping up here now. But I want to talk about what that truly looks like. Okay? I believe that once we start to live a life that recognizes the presence of God, things change. And this is how they change. Every thought becomes God-ordained. Every dream becomes possible. Every word is backed up. Every step is hopeful and purposeful. Every morning is an opportunity. Every failure finds success. I believe every relationship is then heaven-breathed. And every journey you go on has already been forged. Every meeting you have is divine. Every risk becomes commonplace. Every song is then praised. Every whisper is heard. Every pain is comforted. Every moment is planned by God. Every prayer that you speak is deliberate. Every fear is foreign. And your soul is never, ever alone. Anyone know Jesus' last words to everybody? That's right. Let's go, make disciples, teach them, baptize them. And the last line that people forget to say is, I think, I don't hear people talk about it a lot. Therefore, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The very last words that he said, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And tonight it's simple. Yes, we want, to, we want to influence Philadelphia for the good. We want to bring Jesus to the streets of Philadelphia. But in your life too, God wants to reach in your heart and let you know that he is always with you. In fact, he has never left you. He's right beside you. I want to pray for you guys. If you want to stand up?